This is the second chapter of 55 Days in Ravi. My childhood with Muhammad Yunus. Let's begin. I devoted my previous chapter to the life mission of Muhammad Yunus. But there is the Muhammad Yunus in the public eye and the Muhammad Yunus that I knew. The Muhammad Yunus I knew is a very different Yunus. No more a Nobel laureate, no more a global titan in the international fight against poverty, but a friend, a deep friend, who I saw no more than a grandpa who supported me in every step of my way and every step of my journey. We shared an easy report, and when I was young, that matured into a much deeper, grateful friendship as I grew older. Now, Eunice was exactly 64 when I met him. That's no coincidence, 64 is a perfect square, and Eunice was the perfect friend. He threw me a small blue ball, and I bounced it around in my hand and played peekaboo with him uh, while my mom and dad stood off to the side. That's when I first met him. I never talked to strangers, my mom always advised me, and uh, here I was, forget talking, forget playing, I was absolutely jollying around with this man that I didn't even know. The uh, next thing I knew, I had a book in my hands. It's for you, Eunice said, laughing. Muhammad Yunus, the saint, read the title, by Rational Barry. That's you, Dad, I exclaimed, pointing to my dad. Yes, it is, he replied, smiling. Inside, I found an autograph that Yunus had left me that said, Best of wishes, young man. You carry the dreams of Bangladesh within you. Now, alas, as I write this book, I realize I do not simply fulfill a dream of my own, but a shared dream, the dream of a nation, the dream of the people of Bangladesh to lead a better life, to see a stronger world, and to see a healthier people. Now this dream I realized 15 years ago when I first read Eunice's autograph, and I realize it now as I reminisce on our shared memories. Now, Eunice won the Nobel Prize in 2006. It was a day of true joy. A man whom we long knew had devoted his life to the poor, finally being recognized on the international stage. We flew back to Bangladesh on that very day, and in a few steps I hugged Eunice, and he hugged me. And we both knew what that meant. Fame, power, and money change the corrupted, but it spares the saints. And Eunice is no less than the saint of Bangladesh. Indeed, I recognized Eunice as the old friend I had come to play and relax with so many times before, even after he won the largest prize in the world. None of us were surprised then when we discovered that Eunice pledged all of his $1.8 million prize money to building an eye hospital for the poor in Bangladesh and developing Grameen Bank. Now, March 2009 was the sixth year of my life and coincidentally, uh, my sixth encounter with Eunice. My parents took me to the Y29 festival and I entered with no expectations Instead, I was absolutely riddled with joy upon entering the festival. Inside the auditorium, I found two of my greatest idols, Jeffrey Sachs and Muhammad Yunus, sitting down for a rare public interview. Now, I was only six at the time, so you know their words flew by me and the idea spills from one ear to the other. But one thing I understood, our common goal, our shared goal, now, what was our shared goal? Well, from a young age, I realized the fundamental importance of peace and poverty alleviation. And Eunice was pivotal in that understanding. And so I devoted my full attention to my two greatest role models. And yet I did a double take when I heard my name from the stage. Rifa the Barry, please come to the stage. What could I do? The stage compels me forward. As I stepped up, I just couldn't stop smiling. It was instinct more than anything. Here I was, a four, uh, uh, six-year-old, only four foot, uh, four foot five inches maybe, uh, in the presence of two of the greatest titans in the global fight against poverty. For a split second, I truly was standing on the shoulders of giants. 
and what I saw from those shoulders, I still see today. From the slums of India to the shanties of Bangladesh, I see the people in need, people in suffering. And I believe it is our foremost duty in this world to help those less privileged than us. And so this book is a testament to that belief. The belief that the individual must serve his fundamental duty of fighting the common enemy of man. That common enemy being poverty, disease, hunger, and famine. And so I go to India to discover the edge of poverty. Poverty so distinct that the line between millionaires and the poor, the one dollar a day people, is so thin that the rich millionaires of Bollywood live literally a stone's throw from the poor shanties of Dharavi. I go to Dharavi to find the lives of the poor, to hear their stories, and to live their lives. Now, make no mistake, I go now because now is a time more important than ever. In this moment of crisis, humanity faces its hour of maximum danger. One virus no more than a few millimeters thick has brought all of mankind to its knees. Mankind who has stepped on the moon, who has traveled the seas, who has explored the seas and the stars and all in between, who has ventured to explore the unknown and go where no man has gone before. That mankind is now at risk of surrender. To an enemy no eye can see, no politician can arrest, and no army can kill. COVID-19 has all but shuttered humanity from its own home. The streets are empty. The people are gone. And the only sound I sleep to is the sound of the siren. The sound of the ambulance is 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m. through the night. And now I ask... I pose the pivotal question. What if the terror of coronavirus attacked Dharavi? Now this is a question I fear to ask and one I regret to answer. Social distancing does not exist in the most densely populated area on the planet, Dharavi. Dharavi is a slum home to one million people and it's not uncommon to see five or six living in a closet-sized apartment. Dharavi is dense by design. The spaces are so narrow that people and cars walk on the same street. The drinking water is unfiltered and often carries dust or fecal particles in it. And the garbage is often thrown in the river that in turn pollutes the entire area. So if coronavirus ravages America, it'll bring civilization in a third world slum to its knees. Those with weak immune systems are especially vulnerable to COVID-19, and the dwellers of Dharavi fit the bill crisp. Years of pollution, unsanitary water, and unregulated industry has all but scattered the lives and the immune systems of millions. Stay home, socially distance yourselves, you say but realize that staying home is a privilege that these people cannot afford. A river separates them from those who can. Million dollar Bollywood execs who can't stand the sight nor smell of these poor slum dwellers. Under Modi's stay at home order, these people will die starving before the virus ever touches them. And so is the fate of millions of other slum dwellers at this moment. There is suicide going to work and starvation staying home. It is only a matter of time before the virus arrives. A question of when, not if. Now when that time arrives, the infected will start small. They'll seem harmless. But in the days upcoming, the infection will spread like wildfire. A fire no money or politician can stop, no army can kill, 
and no leader can rest. We must stop this fire before it consumes us all. And to do so, I embark on a quest. A quest to prove the fundamental axiom of life. What is that axiom? Well, I seek to prove the power of hope. In this dark time, when humanity is facing its greatest crisis, that is exactly what we need most, hope. Now to do so, I take you on a journey to Dharavi, India, 7,776 miles away from my city of New York. 7,776 miles away is the land of the poor and home of the hopeful. To prove this universal fact, I begin with five stories among thousands. These five stories I listened to in my 55 days in Dharavi. In those 55 days, I saw darkness, the politics, the misery, and worst of all, the death. But on the 44th day, I saw beyond the dark. I saw hope in the people, hope for a career, hope for a family, and hope for a better life for their children. I saw light transcend the dark, and I saw hope transcend the hardship. Indeed, I had no plans to write this story or any of these stories, much less a book. But on my 55th and final day, I realized I could not be selfish. I realized that these stories are far more than my own. They are powerful stories, meant to motivate, meant to inspire, and meant to propel the world and this generation forward. And so as a humble chronicler, of this narrative, I see it as my foremost duty to share these stories of hope and of hardship, addiction and recovery, life and death. Of the thousands of stories I've listened to in those 55 days, many heartbreaking, some tragic, and a few downright unreal, these are the selected few that demonstrate the universal power of hope. Let us commence our journey.